So I've been asked really to talk about symptoms, and I think what is important is not always will the answers apply to you, either sort of in general or what, what things can be, but probably within this talk, something of what you're concerned about or you've had symptoms of will probably apply to you. So I thought it'd be important to find out answers to things like, why am I so tired? Obviously, what can I do about it would be a nice uh, answer as well. Why do I have pain, including why do my fingers hurt? Why is my function so poor? Why am I so itchy? How can I feel better with my acid reflux? How can I stop my diarrhea and bloating? And you might have just heard a talk on uh, GI. What are about feeling full before I'm done eating, and how can I help that? And why are my joints sore? So it's a lot of different symptoms because people don't come in saying I have terrible acid reflux and dysphagia. They say it burns when I swallow. They don't tell me what's going on. We have to sort of sort it out. And as uh, people living with scleroderma know, scleroderma is very complex. So it affects your mental health because it's loss of uh, health as well as mood can be down and then pain and suffering and poor sleep. Uh, loss of income, so working life, body image, emotional well-being, relationships. There might be a need for hospitalization, various signs and symptoms of various organs, sexual health, fertility and pregnancy. So it can affect all these things. And I'm not going to get into all of that, but you can understand how complex your disease really is. So we'll start with fatigue because um, when I looked at patients in my clinic, the average person coming in with scleroderma says my fatigue is 4 out of 10. Zero, not at all, 10 the worst ever. So even people saying, you know, they're okay, have 3 or 4 out of 10 on fatigue. So that's not what you had probably part of to scleroderma. So it's also <coughs> multifactorial, and it's sometimes the most egregious symptom from a patient perspective, very, very annoying and hard to deal with. But it's extremely difficult for us to treat as doctors. And so some of the things that could be due is low blood. And there's two reasons that you could have low blood that could be related to your scleroderma. Iron deficiency anemia. So if you're swallowing to the esophagus has inflammation or growth of esophagitis because of your acid reflux, you can continue to bleed small amounts on a daily basis when acid washes or food goes down. And you could also have iron deficiency anemia if your stomach has those red dilated blood vessels, those tel telangiectasia that you're common to see on your face and mouth and hands. So I, it's called watermelon stomach, and you can bleed occultly on and on and get very, very low blood and be tired. And we can treat that because iron deficiency anemia says find out what you're bleeding from, treat the cause, and also give iron back. And some of our patients need intravenous or intramuscular iron because not always can you tolerate oral iron when your stomach already has poor emptying. It can give, in many people, constipation and sometimes nausea. But that is treatable. But there's also something called anemia chronic disease. And that's inflammation, your autoimmune disease, has as a reaction to it, your bone marrow says, you know what, I'm on partial strike. I'll make red blood cells, but I'm not going to infect it. So the milieu of inflammation signals the bone marrow to be on partial strike and not, so in other words, not making your hemoglobin, your, your blood count, to the fullest amount it could be. And anemia chronic disease is very common in our autoimmune diseases like scleroderma or lupus or rheumatoid arthritis. So anyway, anemia chronic disease means if we could treat the inflammation effectively, then we might be able to um, also help uh, the low blood. So that would be if, say, you had uh, inflammatory arthritis as part of your scleroderma, if we get that inflammation down, or inflammatory part of your interstitial lung disease, if we down that inflammation or your skin being really inflamed, your hemoglobin will improve. So sorry about that, not having the mic. So um, then inflammation itself can cause fatigue. So if you think of someone that has the flu, they have a cytokine storm. They have mediators of inflammation that make them really tired. And having scleroderma is in a way like for some people having the flu. All those signals can make you really tired. The signals of inflammation, the mediators of collagen deposition. So inflammation itself can make you fatigued. 
pain can make you fatigued. And I said the average uh, fatigue scale on zero to 10, the average uh, score is four. That's the same with pain. Now, some people have pain that's 10 out of 10 and some people zero, but the average patient coming in has pain at four out of 10. So if you have pain, it's just harder to do stuff and it wears you out. You usually don't sleep right and so you have fatigue. And poor sleep and pain and fatigue are often very linked. And so sometimes I'll say, okay, why, you know, tell me about your fatigue, how bad is it, and are you sleeping, are you rested? So sometimes I'll address fatigue with say, okay, get, get into exercise, we'll treat your iron deficiency anemia because that's what I found on you, but let's try to restore normal sleep. And let's not try meds first, let's try good sleep routine and things like that. And then sometimes some medications help restore sleep, whereas many sleeping pills put you out but don't give you restorative sleep. So it depends on the quality of the sleep, how much that might be interacting with fatigue. So fatigue, pain, and poor sleep are sort of a triangle that's difficult for us to know which part to uh, address or all of them. Then depression. So anyone with chronic disease that in addition causes pain in people uh, will have depressive symptoms or can have depressive symptoms. But most people that say, yep, I'm down, I'm not happy with my life right now, this pain is really horrible, I'd rather not deal with this, doesn't mean they're depressed. So many people have depressive symptoms with scleroderma, as could their family members as well, but that doesn't mean they're clinically depressed. So a few percent of our people living with scleroderma are clinically depressed, clinical depression usually needs some kind of treatment, behavioral modification, antidepressants, things like that, uh, therapy, um, group therapy or individual therapy, cognitive behavioral training. Uh, so it's not always meds, but a whole bunch of things that can help. So again, depressive symptoms, I'm not going to treat and say, here's your antidepressant. If you're not depressed, I'll say, well, let's, if you feel down because you're in a lot of pain, let's help treat the pain. Then fatigue, everything can be, if you feel like you're in cement and your hands don't work right, you're covered in lead or cement, everything is a strain on you. Just to get up and shower and get dressed and get out the door and think about preparing supper can take way longer when you have scleroderma and other diseases for that matter sometimes. And so the strain of trying to use hands that don't function properly, of uh, elbows that don't bend, tight skin, flexion contractures, can uh, digital ulcers where it's harder to just do your job, your job at home or at work or elsewhere because of touching things, that can be very fatiguing because everything takes more energy and you think twice. So I think that these are most of the reasons why people tell me they have fatigue with scleroderma, but they're not the only reasons, but they would be, I think, the most common ones. And then I've tried to say, depending on what it is, what we do about it. So why would you have iron deficiency anemia, low blood because of blood loss? These are the two main reasons. This is looking down the swallowing tube and you can see the redness here shouldn't occur. These are ulcers or what we call esophagitis. So the stomach's down here. This is the bottom of the swallowing tube and it's red and irritated and that red are open areas and you bleed as food goes down or even sometimes swallowing. And it's usually not that you're vomiting up blood, it's that you're occultly bleeding a little bit each day out of these areas and you can get low blood. <laughs> the other common reason in the GI tract, that's the stomach and you can see why it's called watermelon stomach because it looks like a watermelon. This is normal, these dilated things are prone to bleeding with food in there or acid in there and they, they bleed and you can get very low blood from that. And how do we diagnose if someone has low iron with their anemia, they're iron deficient, I will often send them for a scope. And if we do the upper scope and don't find answers, then I say, well, maybe you can have low blood because of um, occult bleeding from things that anyone's allowed to get uh, at a certain age. We all have a risk of diverticulosis, diverticulitis, um, you know, masses or tumors in your colon that anyone's allowed to get. And for the women in the room, many women that have had heavy periods, even when they go into menopause, can be iron deficient still because they never got ahead with losing heavy blood every month for years. So you could have iron deficiency anemia from your uh, heavy periods in past. So we try to say, 
You might be fatigued because your hemoglobin's low, your hemoglobin's low, and your iron's low. I'll replace your iron and I'll find the source. That might perk up your energy. So those are some of the things. So this is just a snapshot of 100 patients of ours with uh, scleroderma coming to the clinic, mostly women, uh, 10 years, well, 9 to 10 years of disease duration, mean age about 57. And uh, between two visits, functional impairment, your HAC score should be at that age zero. So moderate functional impairment, a little bit worse on follow-up, but pain 41 out of 100 fatigue 46 or 50 out of 100, sleep zero being the best sleep, 100 the worst is 40 out of 100, your global assessment of your well-being on average 40 out of 100, whereas your well-being should be you know, high if you don't have disease. So we do know that this is common, these complaints of, of, of you and the patients that I see. So the next thing to talk about is pain. So until about the last 10 or 12 years, no one was much talking, no researchers were much talking about pain and scleroderma. We always talked about pain in rheumatoid arthritis, pain in things like lupus, but in scleroderma, pain has been under-recognized and really the last decade there's been more research. So it is common, the average pain is four out of 10 or 40 out of 100. Uh, it can go from zero to 100 though in people, of course. And it can be from many sources. So why do I have pain? It could be your Raynaud's and the complications like ulcers. It could be that your skin is tight or breaking down. It could be calcinosis on your skin. It could be that you have pain because your gut doesn't empty right. So that bloating and um, gastric dumping where you, you feel really full early, but then you might get the scoots or cramps, get diarrhea or cramps, that can be painful. So these are some of the reasons, including as well in inflammatory arthritis, myositis or myopathy. Myositis is usually not painful, but could be. The contractures where your um, tendons are always on stretch or on contraction can be painful and give cramps. So there's a whole bunch of reasons why there's pain. So if you say to your healthcare provider, I have pain, I can't just give you a pain med. I actually have to try, to try to sort out, well, why do you have pain? What makes it better? What makes it worse? What do we think it's from? And is this treatable or not? And is it treatable by easy symptomatic, like calcinosis, trying to avoid irritating it, covering it, uh, excising it, isn't that easy, but things like that. Or is it treatable if it's Raynaud's with a bad circulation, improving the circulation, avoiding triggers, things like that. So again, pain is very common and it's so multifactorial. And I haven't given you every list of why you could have pain, but these are some of the common ones that uh, patients will tell me why they have pain. And again, pain is about 40 out of 100 or 4 out of 10 if you look at it on a 0 to 10 scale. On the average person coming in, not in a crisis, not in a flare, just the average patient coming in follow up for their scleroderma. So what about your fingers? So why do my fingers hurt? So you will be able to tell me more about this individually than I tell you as a group, but Raynaud's, your hands going white and blue, poor blood flow. Ulcers that could be from contractures where you're hitting things. Ulcers that could be from poor blood flow and scarring or fibrosis. Um, ulcers that could be from calcium deposits. Contractures can be quite painful and you start doing things differently and develop pain in tendons and areas around your hands. And puffy fingers can be painful and tight skin can be painful. So if you remember back for those who have had scleroderma for a long time, when you first got scleroderma, some people were quite having a lot of pain in their hands. They were puffy, didn't bend right, you weren't used to it, and the inflammation was high then. So that's, and then it's a, probably for you a different kind of pain when you're tight or when you might have softened but you don't bend right anymore. So it's painful to, and sometimes you can't do things like open jars, getting a, a buttons done up, things like that. So Raynaud's is almost everyone with scleroderma and about 3% of the population. And a little bit higher if you have a relative with scleroderma. So many scleroderma patients will say, oh, my son or granddaughter has Raynaud. Should I worry? Because I started with Raynaud's with my scleroderma. But in people living with scleroderma, 
about 10% of their first and second degree relatives have Raynaud's, whereas 1% to 3% of the population have Raynaud's. So it doesn't mean all those people with Raynaud's in the family will get scleroderma. But you can see poor blood flow and then the rewarming of hands, how it's going pink there. The blue as well, you can see there was a healed ulcer here. These things can be quite painful. And for some people, they're not very painful at all. There's a huge spectrum. So again, if you had pain from Raynaud's, I wouldn't say, oh, here's a pain med. I'd say, let's treat your Raynaud's and get you improved. Calcium channel blockers, uh, PDE5 inhibitors, they're the Viagra and uh, Cialis kind of drugs, things like that, and many other meds that have proof to help Raynaud's. So these are some of the ways that we would treat Raynaud's, avoid the cold, don't smoke. If you do smoke, uh, please stop. There's no randomized controlled trials, because, but we know that in general there's more um, poor healing of ulcers in people with scleroderma patients with Raynaud's who smoke, so smoking's not good for you. Calcium channel blockers, that's your um, nifedipine or Procardia, Adelat, those sorts of names and other drugs in that class. Topical nitrates, and there's various ones. Uh, angiotensin II inhibitors, or losartan is the one with data. Cozar, it's also called. One of the antidepressants, the serotonin reuptake inhibitors. So they're your uh, Paxil and Prozac kind of drugs. One of those drugs has a trial showing it helps Raynaud's. The PDE5 inhibitors, prostacyclins, which are difficult for you to get access to in the U.S., but um, epiprostanol and flolan and remodulin troposanol, because Ilopros, the one that has all the trials, is not approved in the U.S. It's an IV one, but there's subcutaneous or short-term IV, so there's some treatments like that. Alpha blocker drugs, so drugs that open up blood vessels uh, are, can be quite effective, but can drop your blood pressure. And uh, ACE inhibitors, that's the drugs that we use for kidney crisis, scleroderma, renal crisis. They don't work in Raynaud's from scleroderma. Yes, so inhaled Ilaprost is, but they don't have trials on inhaled Ilaprost. They have trials on oral Ilaprost, which um, didn't, they probably, probably wasn't absorbed as an, enough. So IV Ilaprost has the data, but inhaled Ilaprost is a, an approved treatment in the U.S. for pulmonary arterial hypertension. So some of the treatments for Raynaud's open up other blood vessels and are approved in pulmonary arterial hypertension, and we just borrow them. But not all pulmonary hypertension drugs treat Raynaud's, just but the other way around. Most Raynaud's treatment um, might or might not help in pulmonary hypertension as well. So what can I expect from Reno's treatment? So when I ask, when I talk to people that aren't necessarily my patients or my patients where maybe I haven't informed them enough, um, I'll say, does your medicine work for your Raynaud's? And they go, I don't know. And I go, well, if you don't know, then it probably doesn't work. So you should know. So what do, but you don't know if no one tells you what to expect. You need a benchmark, right? So in general, the calcium channel blockers will reduce the number of attacks by one third. So you should get one third less attacks. So if you have two bad Raynaud spells every day in the winter and you treat with your calcium channel blocker within two weeks, if it's effective and at the right dose for you, you should say, you know, I'm not getting nearly as many attacks. And there, the severity might be the same when you get them, the duration might be the same, but you should have less of them. So there are the kinds of the things. So what can you expect? Not necessarily a lot. But sometimes people say, I don't think it helps. And I go, okay, stop it and see what happens. And they go, oh, actually, I rebounded. I get like four attacks a day now. And I go, well, then go back on it and see. So it's okay with supervision in context with your healthcare provider to say, you know, if I'm not sure, is it okay to stop or do I have to wean off this drug or what? Um, so it's okay to experiment in the context of someone knowing what you're up to for Raynaud's treatment. It's also quite okay to use it when you need it and not use it when you don't. So I'm from Canada, we have cold winters. So a lot of people in the fall when the temperature, absolute temperature is changing up and down, the Raynaud's gets worse and they start treatment. And if we give you enough of a calcium channel blocker, we might drop your blood pressure, so make you lightheaded. It opens up blood vessels, so flushing and fluid retention in your feet because it can open blood vessels. And this is a meta-analysis we did a long time ago, but showing that calcium channel blockers were better than placebo in scleroderma patients um, and that it gave about five less 
attacks over a two-week period. So that's kind of a benchmark to look at, but about one-third reduction in number of attacks. So some of these treatments are very difficult for you to get reimbursed. So sildenafil, that's Viagra, Tadalafil, Cialis, have positive trials. We, as well as others, have meta-analyzed, so combined the results of the trials to show positive effect. Um, it's more expensive and it's difficult because these drugs have not been filed in the U.S. or in North America to be approved for Raynaud's. So they have positive data, but we have to leave it up to the pharmaceutical company to apply for a drug identification and information number for this indication. So, but I know of ways of helping people to get coverage and I think the Scleroderma Foundation should at some point might maybe consider on the website a statement of data that might help someone just download it, stick it in their letter appealing to get coverage. Topical nitrates, again, not approved in Raynaud's, but two trials showing a topical nitrate. Again, if you get enough, nitroglycerin is what we treat angina with. It can uh, open up blood vessels, give you a headache, flushing, low blood pressure, if you get enough of it. But if you get lightheaded, you can actually wipe it off. But some of these uh, preparations, um, instead of a full dose patch, like someone getting a nitro patch with angina or a heart attack, we use a nitroglycerin tube. So you can put it in your web spaces because your arteries are on either side of your fingers and open up blood vessels that way. And if you get lightheaded or a headache, just wash it off, get rid of it. So people will do that before they go out to their uh, car in the winter time to get the windshield uh, brushed off or when they know, oh, every time I go to my kid's soccer game and it's breezy or cool at night, I get rain out so I can do that, especially the fingers that are involved. So that has proof. And then there's some unproven treatments. Um, so these things don't work. Botox has uh, some case reports and a case series and is undergoing a randomized trial right now. So we don't know the data yet, but maybe. Blocking the sympathetic nerves that clamp the blood vessels seems to work. It has no trials, but some people get these sympathetic blocks or sympathectomies. So that's usually quite severe Raynaud's failing other things. And aspirin has no data, but if there's bad Raynaud's, especially ulcers, I will um, recommend aspirin to get blood flow. Question? So Raynaud's and migraines, so the question is, is, are my Raynaud's related to my migraines? Migraines are vasospasm of the blood vessel, usually of the lining of the brain, the dura that's around the brain. So when that goes into spasm in this area, you might get a headache here, a migraine. And there's data in the literature that vasospasm of blood vessels can go in more than one area. So migraines and primary Raynaud's and interestingly, glaucoma, high pressure in the eye, might be higher than associated. Um, so if you have two of those things, you might, you might or might not get the third. You, you still might not. But they might be higher. But that's mostly primary Raynaud's. So in secondary Raynaud's, your migraines are your migraines. And your Raynaud's is because your blood vessels not only go into spasm inappropriately, it's because your blood vessels don't have proper flow through them. So it's kind of like I always say, our pipes get liquid plumber to open our pipes. In scleroderma, we don't open the pipe. So it's not only in spasm, it doesn't appropriately open. It's, it's thickened around it. So the, the lumen or the hole is too small. So interesting association, but possibly not related. Yeah, so, and there are some things, calcium channel blockers, some, and losartan can also help migraines, but beta blockers we use in migraines, which we tend not to use in Raynaud's. Okay, then there's some complementary and alternative medicine. So staying warm is really important, and that's not really complementary or alternative, but um, interestingly, wearing therapeutic gloves that are ceramic impregnated, those tight gloves that give you a bit of pressure feeling on your hands can help, probably because it warms you, but... They might help because it constricts um, to try to get the blood flow, you know, more pro more this way because that way you don't cool as much as your blood flow out here. I don't know why they work, but it kind of makes sense. Staying warm is the main reason, but other reasons. Laser has some positive data, but not much effect. So if you said, am I going to do laser to help my Raynaud's? I could say, well, you could try it. It's not going to hurt you. But the laser is about as strong as a laser pointer. 
so I can't imagine it would work. And it decreases attacks by about one attack over two weeks. So if you get four attacks a day, one attack over two weeks is probably not very relevant. So it's, it's, it's not, you know, it's safe, but it's not all that effective. A whole bunch of things have been tried, and many of these studies aren't very effective. So there's a whole bunch of things. That doesn't mean it might not work in you. It means that the data show it, it is as good as placebo. And we actually did a study, and I'll tell you the results. So we did a study looking at St. John's wort. St. John's wort can help depression, has positive data. That's an herbal remedy out of a plant, the plant called St. John's wort. It has some drug interactions as well, so it's not for everyone. But it had the possibility of helping Raynaud's, and it did, but placebo was better. So it really didn't work. So it, was, it, it regressed Raynaud's by about 25%, and placebo was about 35% improvement. So it didn't work. So without a proper control, I can say lots of things might help you as an individual. So, you know, I would probably, again, stick with what's easy for you, what makes sense, what's accessible and tolerated before I'd go to, you know, all sorts of other things. And some people biofeedback works, but some people that's training you, usually by a psychologist or someone trained in biofeedback, to raise the temperature of your hands, which is kind of neat. So not everyone can learn that technique, but it might help some people. Complications of Raynaud's, so ulcers, infection, uh, amputation, so getting a surgical or a, uh, removal by without surgery of uh, parts of your fingertip, pits and tuft resorption, losing some um, uh, of your flesh there. And then, so if you have threatened blood flow, very dark finger all the time, never changes, more black than blue, uh, we would give calcium channel blockers. I'd add or switch to either Isoprost, which is hard for you to get, but the sildenafil kind of drug, or epiprostanol is also called Flolan. And that's usually going then to someone expert in scleroderma or expert in Raynaud's because the usual rheumatologist might not be comfortable with this kind of problem and maybe doing those blocks, um, a regional block, stellate ganglion block, or, or a sympathectomy. So there's things like that. So we have an algorithm to help uh, doctors to help you. This is the world according to me. So everything I'm saying on this slide is off-label. Actually, everything I'm saying is off-label, frankly, because there's not approved drugs and Raynaud's in the US. So calcium channel blockers seem in a meta-analysis to heal ulcers, that prostacyclin stuff, and then the, that kind of Viagra and Cialis drugs. Prevention of ulcers, um, Bocentin, that's for pulmonary arterial hypertension, not approved in the US. But statins, atorvastatin, which is also called Lipitor, 40 milligrams a day, so high dose, seems to decrease new ulcers by one third. So 30% reduction in new ulcers doesn't heal them. And this has about 30 to 40% reduction in new ulcers. This is 1,000 a year. This is 45,000 a year. So take your pick. And I think uh, the world according to me by reading the data, but without properly designed large trials, I think the drugs that heal ulcers will also prevent new ulcers, but these drugs do not heal ulcers. It's just different drugs. These open up blood vessel channels. These probably remodel the integrity of the blood vessel. So they're different. And you know, there's ulcers and then there's ulcers. So a couple things, there's one there, and I might treat that differently. It's almost healed. You can see the person's lost fingertip part there. It's uh, some of their fingertip tufts. But ulcers are often multiple when they come. So 15% of people with scleroderma walking through my clinic door have an ulcer today. So 15% on any day, the prevalence, not always fingertips, sometimes here where you bend, sometimes here. And um, on average, if you see one, you see another. So the average number of ulcers is almost two. So some people have eight and some people just have one, but they're often multiple. And there's lots of ways of managing. So sometimes locally debriding ulcers, removing calcinosis. We don't have good drugs to treat calcinosis and all these things we've talked about. Only if it's infected would you give antibiotics. So if, there's, if the pain goes sky high and there's a lot of uh, pussy discolored discharge, not just clear or clear yellow, 
uh, we think of infection, but I do see people overtreated with antibiotics. So if it's a poor blood flow issue, antibiotics not going to help it. If it's an infection and it, with the poor blood flow, antibiotics might help. So we have things to do, and then we the meta-analysis uh, of the poster that I showed yesterday also showed that vitamin E can help ulcers a little bit, which is easy, it's safe, and so that's something you might think about. Question. Right, so painful ulcer um, from scleroderma, I would probably cover it when you're out and about because you don't want other people's bugs in there. I'd probably, for most people, leave it open air when they're at home. I remember to treat pain. These are painful anti-inflammatories, Tylenol, moving anti-inflammatories like Aleve, Advil, those kind of drugs, maybe prescription anti-inflammatories, because anti-inflammatories help pain, not just inflammation. So the things you take for your back pain, uh, like the anti-inflammatories, Motrin and stuff, might help this. Um, sometimes codeine or oxycodone, so the stronger meds. So if you have a bad ulcer, I try to remember to treat for pain. I add aspirin a day, no proof, but makes sense to get blood flow where we need it. So to you know not have the blood flow the blood sort of clot up there at the end. I try to maximize their opening up blood vessels, so calcium channel blockers, PDE5 inhibitors. Sometimes people use topical antibacterial, not because it's infective, but because it's a barrier. So they, it just it makes it feel better not being exposed to uh, the open air. But you don't need an antibacterial topically if, um, if you're not infected. So those sorts of things. And then I get to higher level stuff sometimes. Yep. Right, so lidocaine, Emlon, um, Novocaine, Marcaine, all those things topically can help for pain. And plus, they're a bit of a barrier as well. So if you try that and you say it just burns, you're not going to use it if you try it and it helps for pain. But it will not help healing, it will help, but it will help pain. So I do that. And I sometimes even get a person blocked, but mo again, most rheumatologists or general internists are not going to start blocking your finger and it doesn't last that long. But again, if I deal with these a lot, I can do a ring block. I know how to do that. So I sometimes block. It won't last. It will give them a few hours of relief. I'm not going to block them long term because I do have to get blood flow there eventually because it can put some of the blood vessels in spasm, but it can give pain relief. So there, that's a good thing too. Calcinosis, so again, probably one in three scleroderma patients have calcium deposits under their skin. And this is one of my patients here, so sorry, it's a bit out of focus, but you can see this is inside here. It's right on the tendon. It looks like toothpaste will come out. She couldn't bend her finger, super painful, and it had ruptured open. And this is calcinosis at the top of a thumb tip. And you can see there's no protective skin on top of that. It's just like your skin and no soft tissue. They've lost tough tear compared to here. This is the soft tissue you should have. This has none and this has none. But that's a calcinosis chunk. This might not at all be painful. It might have bothered someone and now it's like having a little tooth in there. If you don't hit it, it doesn't hurt. Toothpaste hurts. So when it's liquidy like that, the milky or toothpaste stuff usually has a lot of inflammation factors coming when it when the calcium is in sort of that kind of solution and you see how red that looks and this can be mistaken for infection they know there's calcinosis we can see it but you say oh this red finger lots of blood flow around it lots of inflammation very painful and hard to deal with and if you start looking you're going to see calcinosis in a few other spots on this person so a tooth doesn't usually hurt unless if it's coming to the surface or you're rubbing it a lot the tooth kind of rock of calcinosis but the toothpaste or liquidy kind can be very painful and it varies and people complain bitterly of this if I had it I would complain as well because everything you do you just tend to hit that area just like if you have a finger ulcer you tend to always hit the one that hurts um, our, we have no good treatment for it. I can tell you lots of things and none of them work very well. So we do sometimes use calcium channel blockers, not so much the Raynaud's kind, but a different class within calcium channel blockers called diltiazem or cardiazyme. You do have that in the US. Um, but it's all made up. Any treatment I tell you for calcinosis is made up. There's not good studies and we need to figure that out for you. 
So why am I so itchy? So early scleroderma, you can have itchiness because your skin is inflamed. This is a bit later with contractures. Um, but so inflammation on the skin. So in early systemic sclerosis, scleroderma, when you're puffy, you actually have more mast cells in the skin, more inflammatory cells, but mast cells have histamine. Histamine makes you itch. Histamine is what's in hives. Histamine is what also makes you sneeze, but it doesn't seem to make you sneeze. It's on the skin and makes it itchy or burning. So that's a problem, and we usually use emollients, don't shower as much, things like that. So the swelling can make you itchy. There's, um, as the swelling changes, sometimes you peel a bit when you've had a lot of swelling and then it regresses. That peeling, just like a sunburn, can make you itchy or painful. It's not a sunburn, of course. And then there's a different reason to itch where there's an autoimmune liver problem that can go with your scleroderma, and that's primary biliary cirrhosis. It's only about um, 1% to 3% of scleroderma people that have this. So unless if, you're, unless if I get the vibe, I'm not going to look into a whole different reason. But that's only uh, increased in the limited scleroderma subset, this autoimmune liver disease, this uh, primary biliary cirrhosis. So itching is mostly because your skin has changed. Your skin is no longer the positive integrity it used to be. And sometimes people don't say itch, they say pain, or they say it's itchy, and I go, wow, that looks really painful. So pain and itch are kind of linked in our brains, and you can experience it one way or in someone else another. Moisturizer, um, I hear all sorts of stuff. If you think emu oil or ostrich this or whatever kind of soap helps you that doesn't dry you out, use it. Your guess is as good as mine, but urea-containing moisturizers can help. Dormer are skin products that, again, are moisturizers, oils, lotions, less washing. And sometimes if you're really itchy, putting oatmeal in the bathtub, if you can get in the tub, can help for itch, just like if your kid has poison ivy. And Aveeno is oatmeal. Same thing, but Aveeno doesn't leave such a ring around your tub. If your hands are really itchy and you can't get in the bathtub, you could actually run your, uh, your laundry sink or your dish sink and put your hands in with some oatmeal. It just helps the itch a bit. So that's why antihistamines, topical Benadryl, or like you had said earlier, the freezing Benadryl, though, is antihistamine. If there's a lot of inflammation, I might give a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory or even low-dose prednisone, steroids for the itch. I might not because some people that are really itchy have rapidly progressive skin involvement and steroids, can prednisone, can increase the chance of kidney crisis. So I might or might not, depending. So those are some of the things. So I would say for most of these things, you guys have figured it out more than your doctor will know. You've already figured out how to deal with it. Why is my hand function so poor? Well, that's uh, lots of reasons. So tight, puffy hands, swollen, puffy hands, tendon contractures, inflammatory arthritis, lots of reasons like that. You can have poor hand function. And if you are early in your condition or if things are worsening, I must say it's highly valuable for you to get some hand therapy. If you don't use it, you'll lose it. If you've lost it and you're all contracted, I might, you might get hand therapy to say, how do I help my function so I can open a jar or how do I do food prep? So an occupational therapist might help you work around. But if you're early on, your hands want to do that in many people. So they want to go into flexion, which means you can't extend them, but you also can't bend them right, and so you can't open things. So if you don't use it, you lose it. And again, for anyone early on, or if you have tips for your, your friends and uh, acquaintances with uh, scleroderma that you might have met um, uh, in your own groups back home or at the conference, um, the therapists that don't know about arthritis too much don't know about scleroderma. So the tip I give the patients is treat me like I'm a burn patient. Every single therapist knows about burn patients. Skin is burnt all the way through, contracts, so scars down, the tendons don't move, and they know what to do then. If you said, I know I don't have a burn, I have an autoimmune thing, but treat me like a burn patient, they kind of know how far to go to use it or you lose it. So I, 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 that's a tip that I learned along the way that can help people. And again, this is later where there's contractures. You can see the pits here. You can see the tuft resorption. So your fingertip pulp is gone. So hitting your thumb would be painful. So needless to say, this person is not going to continue doing a job that is um, uh, word processing as a for instance. 
So functional impairment in scleroderma is as high or higher than rheumatoid arthritis. It often worsens over time, preventing the, the, the joints and tendons and skin that wants to contract can be helpful. Treating the ulcers, treating the inflammatory arthritis, treating the itchy, sore, painful skin or the inflammation of the skin with disease-modifying drugs even might be helpful to improve function. Range of motion, hand exercises, splinting uh, at night, sometimes an open splint at night with your wrist like this because this is very poor function if your wrist goes like that and stretching you at night might be helpful. So even if you're later in the disease, sometimes there's hand therapy things through the occupational therapist that can be helpful. And even a small improvement in the functional score translates to benefits to you, to patients. So when you fill out these health assessment questionnaires, even if you just change a little bit, it can be a positive benefit. It can be the difference between you can do all the food prep or you can't, or you can work around a meal or you can't. Why are my eyes so dry? So 15% of people living with scleroderma have dry eyes or dry eyes and mouth or dry mouth. So Sjogren's complaint. Sjogren's is a guy's name that described autoimmune dryness. So dry, gritty, painful eyes, often worse as the day progresses, can be stuck down in the morning with a lot of uh, clear discharge. Uh, artificial tears several times a day, artificial ge tear gel at night, sometimes restasis, which is cyclosporin eye drops. So this is common in people that develop scleroderma and uh, Sjogren's, so some at the beginning, but it increases the dryness with disease duration. So in a long-standing scleroderma population, 15% have dryness. And so those are the things. And the ophthalmologist, sometimes your optometrist, but an ophthalmologist knows very well how to diagnose dry eyes. They might not know anything about scleroderma, but they know very well about dry eyes and things to help. Tear plugs, other things can help too. But the tear gel by day, you wouldn't wear it because it'd be like looking through a blurred windshield. And dry eyes are very painful to people and it's hard to concentrate and people say my vision's no good but their visual acuity can be fine it's preserved but I always say it's like looking through um, a dirty windshield because you don't have the proper lubrication of your eyes um, of the tears across dry mouth as well and that bad breath from acid reflux or you can't clean as well there's the dry tongue uh, poor hygiene because of uh, the dryness sometimes your meds the acid reflux so a lot of things can happen in the mouth that are a problem can't open the mouth well can't floss way back there with your hands all those can be an issue so i say go to your dentist regularly and dentists know about dry mouth and they don't know about scleroderma necessarily, some do, some don't, but they, they do know about dryness and they can sometimes give you tips to help. So these are some of the tips that we would have. Treat the acid reflux if your mouth is dry, go to the dentist more often and the hygienist to help. Uh, practice opening your mouth in the mirror every day and getting more fingers in your mouth each day to kind of stretch your oral opening if you can. Things like that can be helpful. Why am I short of breath? Well, you've heard at some of the sessions, if you attended them, that you can have lung involvement of the lung um, that gas exchanges, so the parenchyma, interstitial lung disease, or pulmonary fibrosis, or the pulmonary arteries. Your heart might be involved with scarring or fluid around it. You can be deconditioned, meaning I'm, I don't, my exercise capacity has gone down because I'm sick with my condition and I can't do as much. You might be short of breath because if you're um, the diffuse subset, your chest wall can be tight, so you can't take a proper breath and you feel like you're short of breath because it's like being in a tight girdle around your uh, upper uh, part of your chest and your, uh, your diaphragms. And then you could even have diaphragm weakness, which is actually uncommon. So if you're short of breath, I think of all these things and other, I think, well, you could have heart disease. You could have what regular people have too. So I think of all these things and try to look at treatment. Um, for interstitial lung disease treatment, this is always ever evolving. If it's bad enough, we use cyclophosphamide intravenous or oral. Sometimes we use mycophenolate mofetil. You also might know that as Celsept. Or we use azathioprine, which you might have heard of as Imuran. We need induction and we need maintenance. Sometimes we try prednisone steroids, but in most of our patients, they don't work. If it does help, we might use high dose for a month. If you feel way better, maintain you on low dose. If you're not better, we get you off really fast. 
And if you're early in the disease, we're worried about prednisone making kidney crisis come. So we follow blood pressure monitoring of early patients on prednisone in general very carefully. And then there's other drugs that are not, none of this is approved, but these, there's positive data here, trial ongoing here, actually that's just been presented. There's also possibility of rituximab, totally off-label B cell depletion with one small trial looking positive. We know that pulmonary arterial hypertension survival has improved from the 90s to 2000 to later 2000s. So your, your chance once you have pulmonary hypertension to, to live longer has improved on treatment and early detection. And so that's made a big difference for our people living with this. And 8 to 15% of people will get pulmonary hypertension with scleroderma. So it's kind of common. Why do my guts hurt? Well, food sticking, acid reflux, poor stomach emptying, stomach dumping, um, small bowel involvement, large bowel involvement with cramps, uh, constipation or diarrhea, and also the possibility of incontinence. So a lot of problems can occur. So the dilated swallowing tube is very classical in many, many people with scleroderma. The erosive esophagitis or ulcers in the lower swallowing tube um, can occur. Severe gut involvement is about 8%. And these are people that it shows how the muscles in their uh, gut are contracting. It contracts, it gets stronger, it's coordinated in a row like this. Here's scleroderma. There's none of these contractions, no coordinated contractions, not getting stronger. So if your part or all of your GI tract contracts like this, then you functionally have a lead pipe. Doesn't contract, and a lead pipe, bacteria can grow because we suppress acid in your stomach because of your acid reflux, and it's all sitting there in your stomach like a lead stomach tube, and then eventually bacteria overgrow and you get diarrhea because the bacteria make uh, diarrhea occur. So this is, we don't need fancy tests, we just can take a history and usually figure this out, but it shows you this would be a normal contractions in a swallowing tube, but anywhere in the gut it could be. This, uh, these are scleroderma. So big difference on the contractility, and that can be painful and annoying and very painful in some people. And then it, it's worrisome if you have incontinence. So teaching exercises, like after moms have babies, squishing their butt muscles together, their gluteal, and doing a pelvic tilt, they're called Kegel exercises. You can do that 100 times a day, 100 times every hour, and no one knows you're doing it. So I suggest that. For constipation people, it's difficult, so possibly wearing Depends, things like that. Trying to have your bowel movement same time every day, sitting there until you evacuate, doing that before you go out, because it's very, you know, having an accident is very, horrible for an adult, obviously. Um, it's not a good feeling at all. Um, there's the bloating people can get, so that's huge bowel gas. So we, again, treat depending on the symptoms the person has. Sometimes, if you heard Dr. Kana's lecture, I heard the tail end. Sometimes people with constipation have the same problem in their gut uh, it, with scleroderma as those with diarrhea. So we have to figure out, are you constipated because nothing's going through and then eventually you get overflow diarrhea or whatever. So there's a whole bunch of things. And again, almost everyone with scleroderma has poor contraction of their swallowing tube and acid reflux. So it's very, very common. But severe bowel involvement anywhere along the way is about 8% of people living with scleroderma. And sometimes we have to give them nutrition by other means. Supplement oral nutrition, uh, nutrition through a, a tube below their stomach, so a, a JG tube, um, and or nutrition through a central line. So there's ways of helping people and there's drugs to propel food through, there's drugs to treat constipation, there's drugs that might help contractions, and um, you might have heard a little bit about probiotics. They can help some of the bacteria growing, especially when you're on those acid suppressing drugs that are very helpful for your acid reflux. Uh, very, uh, you, you need not just probiotic yogurt, it's like buying probiotics in the fridge of the pharmacy or the health food store because there are a higher amount of bacteria in them. 
So how do we treat GI involvement? So your doctor has to think, what's wrong with your valves? Is it small bowel overgrowth? We usually don't use tests. We say, I think so. I'm going to give you a trial of antibiotics. If you have it and it works for three months, great. I'll give you another trial of antibiotics. If you have it and it helps only while you're on antibiotics, but then you're bad again with bad diarrhea, weight loss, I might have to rotate antibiotics and have you on antibiotics a lot of the time. Um, if you have this uh, poor swallowing tube, you might get a scope, especially the upper tube, looking uh, down the upper tube, upper endoscopy, especially if you have the iron deficiency anemia. And what is different than many patients in the usual GI clinic is that we do off-label exceed the maximum dose of those acid suppressors, those proton pump inhibitors. So if they're approved at one a day, we might go to two, and some of them we might go to four. So we do exceed the dose because there's a dose response on almost all of them that is far higher than the approved dose off-label, not indicated that way, but we do it. And half the rheumatologist said, oh yeah, I frequently uh, exceed the maximum dose of proton pump inhibitors to suppress the acid. Why? Your valve is open, so acid refluxes into your esophagus, easily refluxes. And your stomach is like a whole bag, not contracting right for many people. So your food's sitting there all day, all night, and comes back up the swallowing tube because the valve forgets to close because of scarring. Very, very common. Uh, so you, my swallowing tube, after I swallow, should close. Yours is often inappropriately open. So we do suppress acid dramatically, and we, we aim for dietary modification. Don't eat after supper time. Elevate the head of your bed. All the good things that trigger you, like caffeine, chocolate, and alcohol, alcohol, avoid if they trigger you, um, some people's spicy food. So you have to figure some of it out yourself, and some of it we can certainly help with. So frequent small meals. So we have lots of treatment for these things. These are some of the antibiotics we might use. And then there's one antibiotic that also contracts the bowel. So you'd say, well, why would you give me erythromycin? or its cousin, that gives me diarrhea when you're trying to treat my diarrhea. And I go, because your diarrhea is because your bowel is a lead pipe, doesn't contract, so everything flows through. Erythromycin can lower the bacteria, but is also a pro-contraction agent. So it's a really good drug. I use almost no erythromycin beyond scleroderma patients who have scleroderma bowel, because we have clarithromycin in kids and other drugs for like infections, so tight, um, ear infections in kids and stuff. So erythromycin can help in two ways, but there's some drug interactions, so I always look at the drug list, and the pharmacist also knows your drugs usually, and will do an alert if there's an interaction of something you're on. So we have a lot of ways to help, but again, you come in with a symptom. You don't come in saying, oh, I think I have gastric uh, watermelon stomach, and I have bad acid reflux. You come in with symptoms, and I got to figure that out. Are the doctors involved in your care? Why are my joints sore? 15%, there's a lot of things are 15%. So 15% of our patients with scleroderma have inflammatory arthritis. Many more people have obviously puffy fingers and tendon swelling. But of those 15%, about half are severe and destructive. That's destructive scleroderma wrist. That um, there's a mal uh, formation, like a subluxation here. It's malaligned here. Uh, so there's different kinds of inflammatory arthritis. So the smart doc, who's a rheumatologist, might actually say, oh, you have low-grade inflammatory arthritis, we'll try hydroxychloroquine, methotrexate, low-dose prednisone, things like that. The antimalarials are hydroxychloroquine. Um, the sophisticated uh, doc might say, as well, you have high grade, it looks like you're a rheumatoid arthritis overlap and destructive. We might use those biological drugs if the usual disease-modifying drugs don't work. And I tend to think of inflammatory arthritis three different ways. So 8% of bad inflammatory arthritis, so not everyone. Some of those are a rheumatoid overlap. Just treat what's treatable. Treat like rheumatoid. Some are very destructive, and that's the rare group, very minimal group, who look like a mutilating arthritis. And that's one of my patients here that I tried to show. That is totally destroyed. These are bones here. This Someone erased them. It's totally destroyed. I treat them like psoriatic arthritis mutilans, which has some drugs like RA, but rheumatoid arthritis, but not all the same. And some look lupus-like. And our rheumatoid drugs that are advanced therapeutics, those fancy biologics that we use in rheumatoid, don't actually work so well in lupus. So if you have a non-destructive inflammatory arthritis, you might look more like lupus on your joints. So I have to do that by a history of physical and sometimes by x-rays. 
sometimes by your blood test, what is, you know, do you have some lupus autoantibodies or not? So I treat what's treatable, and I treat like whatever you're mimicking. If you look like GAVRA, I can treat it rheumatoid, usually effectively too. So we got to just think, and most rheumatologists know about inflammatory arthritis. Like that's our bread and butter um, for most rheumatologists. So they can figure that out and help along the way. And we publish on this kind of stuff to help people treat you. So inflammatory arthritis experts said these sorts of drugs that I mentioned, and then second line, maybe you know switching or adding some of these other drugs and maybe going to biologicals. So there's ways of treating, then splinting, injecting joints, things like that can help. So I've tried to take you through with um, the time that we had, why do I feel badly? Fatigued, pain, poor function, specific areas of pain like your gut and your hand and ulcers and some of the other complaints you might be having. And I realize that for you, this only brushes the surface of you living with this every day or your family member living with it. But I think it gives you the way that your healthcare provider will think because you come in with symptoms and I have to try to figure out what is it from and therefore precisely what can I do? So we have to be very holistic in looking at you and I, we don't always want to push drugs either. We want to get the right treatment for the right patient at the right time.